Hi, this is Father Bill W. here in Austin, Texas, and I want to welcome you back to the podcast. I am a recovering alcoholic, been sober in AA, coming up on, I guess, 48 years in uh, in December. So uh, it's been quite a ride. I'm very grateful to the program of AA and all the people who have helped me all along the way. Um, if you are new to these uh, podcasts, I would uh, welcome you to really go and visit our website at Two Way Prayer at gmail.com. I want you to learn about the process that teaches you um, a form of prayer and meditation that they used to do in the early days of AA. And if you haven't attended one of our workshops, uh, we'll have a two-way prayer workshop on the second Saturday in November and the second Saturday again in December. It's the same workshop, teaching people how to do the practice and and giving you some of the history. Uh, I hope you'll uh, do that if you haven't done so already. Well, we're in the middle of our series now on the subject of psychic change. And it's a really important subject for anybody who's in recovery because it's it's re- it's really what the goal of recovery is. I mean, the ultimate goal, I guess, is to, is to not drink and not drug and all that good stuff. But this is, this is the vehicle for doing that. Uh, Carl Jung sent his patient Roland in search of a psychic change. He helped uh, Ebby in that process, and Ebby brought the process to Bill, and Bill had a psychic change in his detox room there in Towns Hospital. One of the phrases uh, from the big book that has always uh, jumped out at me is, free me from the bondage of self. You know, most of us know this as part of the third step prayer. But it's also, I think, a very genuine statement of of what is perhaps our deepest desire, the desire to be free of our own selves. And and if you think about that, maybe it sounds a little crazy at first, you know, I mean, dogs and cats, they don't they don't have this desire. Uh, But 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 for us humans, I think it goes to really um, the heart of the difficulty of being a human being. See, see, we are both body and spirit. And it would be a hell of a lot easier if we were one or the other, but balancing and integrating the two, that really is our task. Uh, so there's, there's something deep inside of us that, that feels incomplete, disconnected if, if we haven't achieved this goal. Uh, if we haven't accomplished uh, what some might, might really say we are really here to do. And that's especially true, I think, for those of us who are alcoholics and addicts. We, we really feel this deep inner divide. Now, by about the age of 12, I'd had about all of me that I could stand. And, uh, and that's when I had my first drunk. And what that first drunk did for me was... it. I didn't know this at the time, but it it freed me from that bondage of self. And this is what alcohol does for for us, those of us who find our way to recovery. We get a taste of heaven. We experience a a, a state of euphoria. I I guess you could say it is a temporary psychic change. And I I found it encouraging to learn that uh, Carl Jung also had a first drunk, he was a few couple of years older than I was, but it seemed to make quite an impression on him too. Uh, he visited a distillery at the age of 14, and this is where he describes it in, in his memoirs, uh, and I quote, uh, I got gloriously, triumphantly drunk. There was no longer any inside or outside. Caution and timidity were gone, and the earth and sky, the universe, and everything in it that creeps and flies, revolves, rises, or falls, had all become one. And if alcohol uh, could just do that, if it if it could just do that all of the time and, and forever. What a wonderful thing it would be. But uh, we know what happens, don't we? After a while, it takes more and more of the stuff to get us to the same place. And then that place changes. 
And what was heaven uh, pretty soon evolves into hell. By the end, most of us are no longer drinking for euphoria. But we're rather drinking for oblivion. So what's the solution to this? And I think this is where Jung and AA agree on exactly the same thing. It is finding this strange, elusive thing we call a psychic change. And it's a change not just around the edges of self. Ultimately, uh, I think it's really the death of an old self and the birth of a new one. And this is the spiritual journey that each of us is, is traveling. So as we said in, in some of the earlier episodes, this psychic change can be sudden or it can be gradual. It can be dramatic or it can be, as William James called it, the educational variety. Either way, the big book calls it tapping into an unsuspected inner resource that we come to identify with a power greater than our old selves. In step 12, we're, we're nearing the end of that spiritual quest, at, at least the way it's put down on paper. We've set out in search of this power, and I would argue we, we really set out in search of the experience, some of the elements of the experience that I'm going to talk about in, the, in this particular episode. It's a life-changing experience of this power, what, what it's like to be connected to it. And um, so I, I, ho I hope you find it interesting. Now, we know that uh, people have had these experiences throughout history, and, and they've had them seem most frequently when they were experiencing tremendous pain or, or found themselves in grave danger, and they're calling out for help. In this episode, we're going to explore what some of those people report about these different experiences. What are the qualities uh, they seem to have in common? Uh, maybe not to everyone. Uh, everyone has each one of these uh, qualities. They don't experience uh, perhaps all of them, but most do. And uh, I'll be taking this list from chapter 10 in Professor William Miller's book titled Quantum Change. And uh, the first four qualities that he describes in that chapter, he takes directly from William James's book, Varieties of Religious Experience. And it's the same book uh, that Wilson studied in his detox room after he had his hot flash. So uh, what we're going to be hearing is what Wilson was reading, at least, at least for the first four of these puppies. Eh? So what are they? Well, the first one, James says, is ineffability. And that's a, don't let that word throw you. It's a fancy way of saying this, that these spiritual experiences actually defy expression in words. So when, when someone talks about one of these experiences, you're going to hear them say, it was like this, or it was like that. But bottom line, we can't really put whatever it was into words. So Wilson reports what? It was as if I stood on a mountaintop and a wind of spirit and not of air was blowing all around me. For Frank Bookman, the founder of the Oxford Group, he said, it was as if I saw the face of the master. And it was Bookman's own resentments and hatreds towards his board of directors that was causing the pain that he visioned on the face of that master. Hey, each one of our spiritual experiences is different. And each one defies the abil our ability to put it into words. It's, I think if you, if you really analyze it, it's, it's like trying to take a right brain experience and then put it over to the left brain in the form of language. And it simply doesn't translate. You're just not able to do it. So this is the ineff ineffability. Okay? And the second one uh, is that it has a noetic quality. Uh, these Harvard professors use big words, a noetic quality. What does that mean? It means that the experience often conveys a message that out of, out of this encounter with the divine, I, I bring back from it a message. And for Wilson, he said he knew immediately after his experience, his time on the mountaintop, he knew that he was a free man. 
That was the message, that he was indeed a free man. So the message comes from a powerful source, and, and a truth winds up being revealed. Uh, one patient of mine, I'll never forget this guy, because uh, I, I was hammering away at him, and I wasn't getting anywhere, uh, you know, in, in his recognition of his own alcoholism and addiction. And uh, he, he left treatment and wakes up in an Exxon uh, gas station bathroom. And, and he got the message looking in the mirror and not knowing the guy that he saw looking back at him. He said he heard a voice telling him that he was an addict and he knew, you know, we must uh, acknowledge to our innermost selves. Well, so this is what connects us or can to our innermost self. Even my own uh, mini white light experience came when I hit my bottom. And, 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 I, and it also came with a message. I've, I've been really big on the geographical cure, been all around the world several times, eh? and, and I was a runner. And I was down to two pl last places left to run to. One was India and the other was uh, Australia. And I swear to God, this is the truth. I heard a voice in my head uh, and it said this, Bill, if those are your two choices, there's something wrong with you. And it cracked me open. And there was my message. I knew I couldn't drink. And now I knew one thing more. I knew that I couldn't run. And that message has carried me for nearly 50 years. Hey? Um, and maybe something like that has happened in, in, inside your mind as, as, as well. And, and if it has, uh, please uh, send, me, send me a little uh, uh, audio version of that. Keep, keep it short. I'd love to uh, collect four or five of them and share them when we get towards the end of this uh, uh, the series. The third experience is, is that it has a transience quality. And that means simply that it doesn't last very long. Maybe a minute, may, maybe, maybe more. Rarely up to 30 minutes. But, but pretty soon it fades. It's like I go someplace, but then I come back. Okay? And there's an intensity to this experience, and we, and we can only bear it for a short time. We, we can't seem to stay there. And the spiritual experts, uh, the mystics, tell us that there's a real danger if we try to stay there. They all warn us about that. And this is probably uh, why step two comes in two parts. See, the first part is have that spiritual experience or awakening, but the second part is then go carry the message. Have the mountaintop experience, but then come down from that mountain and go help the next suffering alcoholic or addict. You can't stay on the mountain. See, that's one of the stories in the, in the gospel where Jesus has his transcendent experience on Mount Tabor and, and, uh, and the disciples who always get it wrong, they say, well, let's build three tents here. You know, We ain't coming down from the mountain. And Jesus says, no, you can't do that. <laughs> it's, not, it's not what it's for. The work's in the valley, hey? So beware of becoming a, what uh, I used to call a bliss ninny, hey? Just seeking the experience. Um, uh, seeking the experience is not where it's at. Seeking the experience can keep us stuck, can keep us going from retreat to retreat, from guru to guru, from... 12-step uh, meeting to 12-step meeting, hey? it keeps us from doing our work, or it can. It can. They're wonderful if they happen. But every, every, every spiritual teacher will say they're not necessary for it to happen. And certainly not all of the parts are going to happen. But you are going to have tastes of it. And, and so uh, that, that's why I'm going into this in, in some depth here, because because I'm, I'm, I know that, that many of you have had many of these experiences, maybe not as dramatically as some of the people. Uh, mine were not all that dramatic, but they were real and they're important. The fourth one um, is the experience that William James called a passive quality. And that just simply means that we are the ones on the receiving end of this experience, and we know that. The ego is temporarily out of being in control. 
It's participating in the experience. It's observing the experience, but it is definitely not in control of the experience. <clears throat> like we're being acted upon. And in this part of the book, Miller quotes Paul Tillich, and he was one of the great theologians of the last century. And, and Tillich puts it like this. He says, it's as though a voice were saying, you are accepted. You are accepted, accepted by that which is greater than you and the name of which you do not know. Do not ask for the name now. Perhaps you will find it later. Do not try to do anything now. Perhaps later you will do much. Do not seek for anything. Do not intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. I mean, that's our serenity prayer. It's all about acceptance. I mean, we start with acceptance of, of the illness, but that's just the beginning of the journey. And then it's, it's really ultimately going to be the acceptance of God into the deepest parts uh, of our lives. God acts on us. I mean, that's, that's what this, uh, this passive quality is about. It's a gift. And the transformation begins. Now, after examining uh, these four qualities that he takes uh, uh, from William James, Miller switches uh, to the work of still another Harvard professor. His name is Dr. Walter Pankey. And in the late 1960s, uh, Pankey researched spiritual experiences among a group of his graduate students. And I won't go into the details of that experiment. It's interesting, but I don't want to trigger anyone uh, out there with uh, how this professor went about doing it. It's uh, not, not exactly recommended. But anyway, here, here are some five additional things about these experiences that, that, that he recorded. And then they, they are these, the experiences generally brought, we'll call this number five, a sense of unity, unity with other people, unity with nature, unity with the universe. And, and maybe the more disconnected we are, the more we can appreciate the new sense of connectedness that we begin to feel. Big Book says we are a people who ordinarily do not mix. And now we're mixed, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, we, we're in a different state of consciousness. And it, it's like coming home, coming back to our real home. It often has a quality of remembrance about it. This is frequently uh, discussed. So here's the monk Thomas Merton describing the sense of unity an experience like this can bring. Merton says, it is beyond words, and it is beyond speech, and it is beyond concept. Not that we discover a new unity. We discover an older unity. My dear brothers and sisters, we are already one, but we imagine that we are not. And what we have to recover is our original unity. What we have to be is what we are. So we live in a time of, of really tremendous disunity going on in the world. Things are, are really falling apart. And, and that makes it very hard. You know, uh, the containers that are there to hold us, um, uh, family, uh, church, um, society, they're really quite crumbling uh, for, for some time now. And in the old days, they could provide some of this unity, but, but not so much anymore. And that is why the spiritual path is so tremendously important. It, it, it's perhaps uh, the thing that is still open to us is to travel this path. And it's an inner journey. It's going inside and, and becoming that, uh, that self who we really already are, but don't know. All right, the sixth um, uh, attribute is a sense of transcendence. And that means a sense of timelessness, a sense of being beyond space and time. Big Book calls it entering the fourth dimension of existence. It's arriving at the other end 
after the dark night of the soul, and, and it feels different. It's relaxed. Eh? Uh, it's like entering the eye of the hurricane and finding peace and calm with 150, 180 mile an hour winds whirling around uh, like a whirlwind. Huh? I'm safe. Why? Why am I safe? Because my ego is now right sized. It's able to listen. Eh? It's able to be taught. It's humble. It's humble. That's a huge, huge part of this journey. And seven is experiencing, uh, he says, a sense of awe, A-W-E. And the mystics of all religions describe it as being in the presence of what they call the other, or some call it the absolute, or Tillich, in his case, called it being itself with a capital B. All right. It's um, and, and when we are in the in the presence of that, when we feel the presence of that, the natural inclination is to bow, to genuflect, to take your shoes off. If you're like Moses, hey, I'm in touch with something holy, and and I know it. Hey, and 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 that this is the res proper response to the presence, is a sense of awe. I uh, found a really nice quote by Albert Einstein, pretty smart guy. And he said this, he who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. Sometimes I go out in the backyard and I look up in the sky and I, uh, I see the moon and I see the stars. And, uh, and when they're really bright, uh, or when the sun is going down in the west and, and, and it, it's just lighting up the sky, there is a sense of awe that comes over me. Uh, that's, that's, I know I'm in the presence of something really big. So here's an awe quote from a woman uh, Professor Miller interviewed. Uh, she was a woman in real despair. She was contemplating suicide. About a third of the people that uh, um, Miller interviewed uh, when he was studying uh, uh, quantum changes. About a third of them, he said, were in prayer when it happens. So she's in real despair. Uh, and here's her experience uh, in her own words. She said in the interview, that night, I remembered that I had a religion once. I'm not a church member, not a religious person. I am a spiritual person but I had no affiliation to any religion. So this is not gonna be one of those born again Christian stories. I'm not going to tell you that I suddenly saw the light, but I did have this Christian background. And that winter night, I suddenly remembered some of the things that I had read. So that night I asked for help. It was almost two or three in the morning. I said, please help me. From the bottom of my heart, I asked for help. I said, please, please show me what you want me to do. And suddenly, it was like this angel appeared in my mind, and this voice said to me, turn to me, just like that. I felt a presence. I didn't really see a vision. It was just a feeling of light. I opened my heart, and something came in. Whether it was from me going out, or it was coming in, I can't say. It was the meaning that was important. It wasn't a long, drawn-out thing. I didn't see a blinding flash or anything else, but somehow I just knew everything from then on was going to be all right. It was like I suddenly burst through and let go, and everything, everything had changed. There was help right there, right there. The whole thing lasted maybe 30 minutes or so. And then I fell asleep. It was the most amazing night of my life. See, I think we have these things and, uh, and, and we hold them in our hearts and we, and we don't share them uh, very easily or readily. The eighth experience has uh, what, what they call an element of positivity. And that means the nature of the other is almost always perceived as positive, as loving. It is here to take care of me. All is well. As one of the mystics uh, is, is, is fond of being quoted, all is very well. 
A lot of people who have near-death experiences, frequently they'll report that they don't want to come back, that they felt bathed in a light, they felt loved and cared for. You know, in my own two-way prayer experiences, I've been doing that, this practice for 28 years. So I'm, I'm listening to this voice, this presence, the, the great reality within, as the book calls it. And one of the most amazing things about the, my 28-year experience with it is that that voice is always positive. I have never been yelled at. <laughs> and I've done some wrong things, okay? Never, ever yelled at, all right? Always gently redirected. Are you ready to change? Are you ready to do more? Are you ready to go in a different direction? Always gentle, always positive. The ninth and, and the final element they record is that it has an element of distinctiveness. Uh, quotes from Miller, it's different from ordinary reality. Some people describe a light, but it's unlike ordinary light maybe more of a glow, an aura. Some report it as a light not falling upon them, but emanating from within them. Sometimes if you're in the presence of a really holy person, uh, you kind of sense that light. You, you, you almost can see an aura around them. I heard, uh, I had the real pleasure of hearing Chuck Chamberlain in Atlanta, I was probably about five or six years sober, if that, and uh, got a chance to go and hear him. I'll never forget it. Uh, when he came out on stage, uh, there was a light around him, and I could see it, and I could I could sense it, uh, see it in quotes, see it in quotes. I mean, this this is this is this is this is not ordinary vision. This is you're in the presence of somebody holy. And, and, and you sense something very different. Okay? Um, so uh, just a final word of, of warning about all of this, you know, uh, um, and wonderful and life transforming as these experiences can be, there is no guarantee that they will change you. I want you to hear that. Miller was more amazed, he said, and how many people he interviewed had had experiences like this. And guess what? It did not change them. Uh, so let me repeat the words. I, I quoted this in, in the last episode, but it's worth quoting again. It's from uh, medieval mystic Meister Eckhart. And he says this, If when meditating you ever enter a state so blissful, that you would choose to remain there forever. Tear yourself free as quickly as you can and seize on the task next at hand. For these are melting sensations and nothing else. The work is in the valley. We go up to the mountaintop and I say, go to that mountaintop as often as you can. I, I, I think of my... Uh, my little uh, quiet time each morning is a bit of a mountaintop experience. Uh, but I, I know every time I go there, I am sent back down. I am, I am not uh, meant to be a hermit. I'm not meant to uh, go live in a cave. I'm meant to go live in the world. And I'm meant to go and live in that world with the message, carrying the message. See, I mean, that's that's the 12th step. Having, having had this experience, having had it, we try to practice these things. We try to get better at these things, experience these things at a deeper and deeper level, and then carry them out to the world. So um, I, I hope this wasn't too heavy. I, I hope it was helpful for you. And once again, if you've had uh, a spiritual experience of some nature, if you could get it into some audio version and uh, send it to me. I'd like to collect some of these and we'll try to play them at the end of the series. You can contact me at twowayprayer at gmail.com. So please um, uh, keep coming back and God bless. Take care.